Good evening, everybody. Welcome to iFocus Online Lecture 246 and the Lecture 33 of Squint and Pediatric Ophthalmology. Today, we have Dr. Jyoti Matalia from Nara Netralia, Bangalore, talking to us on step-by-step -step strabismus surgery, choice of surgery, dosing, and basic surgeries. I invite Dr. Pradeep Sharma, our chair, to invite the speaker to, uh, to all the audience. Thank you, Deepti. It's really a pleasure to welcome and uh, introduce Dr. Jyoti Matalia, uh, a young strabismologist from Bengaluru. She did her MBBS from uh, Mumbai BAYL Nair Hospital, post post graduation, State GS Medical College, KEM Hospital, and then fellowship training from LV Prasada Institute, Hyderabad, India. She has also done her ICO fellowship at the Wilmer Eye Institute, USA and a volunteer faculty of Orbis International to teach and train ophthalmologists in developing countries. She is the head of pediatric ophthalmology, strabismus and neuro-ophthalmology at Narayan Nitrale to Narayan Health City, Bangalore, India. And she is the in charge of postgraduate training of her institute and runs fellowship programs in pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus. She has trained more than 30 fellows till date. Her areas of interest include pediatric cataract, neuro-ophthalmology, and teaching is her passion. She has presented more than 250 lectures at conferences in India and abroad, apart from virtually delivering over 50 lectures in webinars, uh, award-winning teaching videos presented at several national and international conferences like American Academy of Ophthalmology, European Society for Cataract and Refractive Surgery, AIOS, WSPOS, more than 50 publications in peer-reviewed national and international journals, 10 book chapters and 10 awards to her credit. She's ably going to be presenting this topic, which is going to be one of the most interesting topics, step-by-step -step surgery, dosing. And so this is the first part of the two uh, talks on this uh, subject. So over to Dr. Jyoti for starting her first talk. Thank you, Dr. Sharma and Deepti. Yeah, so at the outset, I'd like to thank Dr. Santosh Honavar and the team iFocus for giving this opportunity. I'm going to be talking on basically step-by-step -step of strabismus surgery in two parts. Part one is going to be on basic surgeries, everything about dosing, etc. And the next is going to be about complex surgeries. Uh, let me start. What are the indications? So the idea of this talk is going to be about tips and tricks to let you know how to go about. There is so much theory available, but what you as a strabismologist can do and get the best outcome. So let's understand when would you do squint surgery for functional and reconstructive reasons, functional is to restore binocular single vision, enlarge the field of binocular vision, to correct eye alignment, to relieve diplopia and to relieve mechanical restriction. The reconstructive is to correct abnormal head posture and cosmesis. As rightly mentioned by Ro Rosenbaum, that surgery is needed to rehabilitate disability. Kushner has shown that 86% of adult strabismus develop binocular fusion in post-operatively. Similarly, it leads to expansion of peripheral visual field in about 30%. So strabismus that creates a negative social prejudice and affects employment ability can be reversed by surgery. So when people say it's only cosmesis and it's not important, we need to make them understand that no, it is a reconstructive surgery. Now let's understand the applied anatomy. A set of four recti and two obliques control the movement of each eye. These four recti muscles originate from a common tendinous ring called annulus of Zinn attached at the apex of the orbit encircling the optic foramina and the medial part of the superior orbital fissure. All four recti run forward in a diverging manner to get inserted on the sclera forming the spiral of Tylox. Now this is very important because we have to know where these muscles really lie. So medial rectus is 5.5, inferior rectus 6.5, lateral rectus 6.9 and superior rectus 7.7. Seven. Medial rectus has the shortest arc of contact. It is the easiest muscle to lose and the hardest to find and the only extraocular muscle without facial attachments to an oblique. 
Lateral rectus has longest arc of contact and a lost lateral rectus can be retrieved by tracing the inferior oblique muscle to its insertion. The superior rectus has attachments with the levator palpebral superioris and superior oblique muscle. One has to avoid shearing of the anterior portion of the superior oblique insertion while operating on the superior rectus muscle. There are facial connections between the inferior rectus, inferior oblique and the lower lid retractors called lockward ligament. These have to be severed during very large recessions. So what we need to understand is except for medial rectus, every other muscle has some attachment. So it's easy to retrieve it in case it's lost and sometimes even able to hook them if you're not able to find them, except for medial rectus, which therefore if slipped is very difficult to be found. The anterior ciliary vessels which supply the recti are seven in number. Two for each recti except the lateral rectus which has only one. And this fact needs to be taken into consideration while operating on more than two recti. The superior oblique muscle arises from the body of the sphenoid bone, moves forward to reach the trochlea of the frontal bone turns posterolaterally and under the superior rectus muscle fans out and gets inserted onto the sclera superotemporally. The inferior oblique arises from the orbital plate of the maxilla, passes laterally and backwards between the inferior rectus and the floor of the orbit and gets inserted behind the equator at a point corresponding to the foveal region. Superior oblique has an anteroposterior fan shaped insertion. During surgery, ensure all the fibers are completely picked up while hooking. Inferior oblique muscle inserts over the macula, so extreme caution is needed to avoid scleral perforation and damaging the macula. Now coming to the important aspect, pre-operative assessment is a must because that will help us plan the surgery, starting with a good history. We have to rule out neurological diseases because in those cases, we may need to undercorrect depending on the type of strabismus. Look at the family photographs, that is a fat scan. Document the time of onset of strabismus. Anesthetic complication to be kept in mind, especially bleeding diathesis. History of trauma, strab strabismus surgery elsewhere also has to be noted. You have to look ocularly for any nystagmus, abnormal head posture, which has to be simultaneously dealt with when you are doing strabismus. Lid abnormalities, because sometimes a pseudo-strabismus has to be ruled out. Visual acuity recording is a must because planning will depend on that. A cycloplegic refraction, sometimes glasses itself corrects it, so ensure that that has been done. Anterior segment to look for any conjunctival scars, blebs, scleral, buccal, etc. so that we know where to intervene, what could be the problems that can come, can come during surgery. Fundus macular pathology or scarring so that our outcomes can be planned and sometimes we have to even plan the surgery depending on the presence. Other important is identifying eccentric fixation but that will decide our surgery uh, planning as well using the direct ophthalmoscope to see if there's a parafoveal or macular reflex etc. Test the ductions, versions and versions. FDT and FGT in adults has to be done preoperatively but sometimes intraoperatively a couple of times that I will show you. Orbital imaging must in thyroid myopathy, strabismus fixes, slipped or lost muscle because it will help us detect where it is and what could be planned. And now we have the AS ASOCT, which is a new kid on the block, and that can help us look for the position of the muscle, especially in reoperations. Now, anesthesia could be general or local. General is reserved for children, reoperations and bilateral surgeries, local adults and unique. Lateral. Also importantly done is topical anesthesia, which is a preferred technique by some surgeons, well tolerated, but studies show that it's not very uh, different in terms of normal. So it all depends on the surgeon's choice. Now comparing the microscope versus the loop, it depends on what you have learned and what your mentor has taught. Remember, you should have a good magnification with the microscope compared to the loop, and it can be as high as 6 to 10x. In terms of field, yes, you get a lesser one with microscope and wider with the loop. And you can also maneuver and move around when you have the loop. But fine details and operating my, things like superior oblique and reoperations are done better with microscope. Whereas loop, you have to maintain the working distance, especially for novice surgeons, because it can cause strain and headache. Now, counseling is a very important part before surgery. You have to explain the chances with first surgery, how much it is, and the chances of reoperations. Especially in conditions like intermittent XT, where the success rate is less, we need to give them the option so that they are aware 
how many surgeries will be needed. Post-operative diplopia has to be explained, very clearly told, no effect on visual status, but yes, you need to also keep in mind the possibility of scleral perforation, which needs to be ta tackled and de uh, dealt with at the same time to prevent any other issues. Treatment also have to be told, does not stop with surgeries, Glasses and or patching may need to be continued to maintain the clarity of vision and sometimes to improve the success of surgery as well. Now, one thing which I mentioned during the video was arc of contact. Now, what is that? The point at which the tendon first touches the globe is a tangential point and distance between the tangential point and the center of anatomical insertion of the muscle is the arc of contact, which is least for the MR, which you can see as six millimeters and highest for the LR, which is 15 millimeters. Now, what happens is the power of the muscle is proportionate to its arc of contact. So the more you recesses, recess a muscle, the arc of contact reduces and that weakens the muscle. But remember in MR, if you go too much behind, then it will cause an adduction limitation in addition. So that is the reason why you should know how much maximum to do. Now, what are the general principles before we go into the steps of the surgery? Distance of each rectus muscle from limbus must be taken into consideration, which I mentioned, so that you know exactly where to hook and where to find the muscle. The muscle insertions at new locations must be splayed and not narrowed. Otherwise there's a central sag. And how do you do it? When you mark the muscle, try to go a little beyond it so that eventually the needle comes right at the point where you have marked so that there is no central sag. While performing vertical transposition of horizontal recti, try to keep the muscle shift concentric to the limbus. Never operate on three muscles at a time. As I mentioned to you, the risk of anterior segment ischemia can develop. If you want to do it, do it in a stage fa fashion, at least four to six months apart. Sclera is thinnest at the insertion site, hence keep a stump of the muscle to allow resection, resuturing. Avoid damage to vortex veins and tendons during supramaximum recession. Hence, you should know your anatomy very well and the surrounding structures so that it can be avoided. So what is the basic correction offered during strabismus surgery. It is by three, by five different mechanisms, slackening a muscle that is recession, muscle lengthening, which is Z myotomy, or insertion of a silicon expander or any suture, which will increase the length, tightening a muscle that is resection or plication, reducing moment arm that is Fardin's procedure and changing the vector force, which is transposition. So now I will be just showing the normal instruments that I use. I don't have any finances related to that, but something which I tend to use in my clinic. The various instruments which are needed for the squint surgeries are Helveston's muscle hook, Stevens small hook, Barbie retractor, Lester's fixation forceps, Helveston's curved fixation forcep or Moody's curved fixation forceps, non-tooth forceps, tenotomy scissors, curved ruler, Wright's grooved hook, castrovigor scalpers, artery forceps, locking and unlocking needle holders, bulldog clamps, and 6O and 8O vicral sutures. So these are the instruments that I use. People obviously will have different ones, but I'll tell you the significance of why I prefer them. Helveston's muscle hook is a slim hook and can be used to pass through tighter muscles as in thyroid ophthalmopathy. Stevens small hook helps in retracting the tissue away. Barbie retractor helps in supporting the globe in the fornix incisions. Lester's fixation forcep helps in fixing the globe while doing the force duction test. Helveston's curved fixation forceps helps in fixing the globe while taking conjunctival incisions, scleral sutures and for proper orientation in fornix incision. Curved ruler is useful for very large measurements. Wright's grooved hook is useful for avoiding inadvertent scleral perforation in very tight muscles. The locking and unlocking needle holders allow suturing through the muscle and through the sclera with ease. Before beginning any squint surgery, a routine force duction test is performed either by a two-hand or one-hand technique. For the medial rectus muscle, hold the forceps at 6 and 12 o'clock and move the eye laterally. With the one-hand technique, the globe is held at 3 o'clock and moved laterally. Similarly, for the lateral rectus, hold the forceps at 6 and 12 o'clock and move the eye medially. And for the one-hand technique, 
place the forcep at 9 o'clock and move it medially. For the superior rectus, the forceps are held at 3 and 9 o'clock and the eye is moved inferiorly. For the one hand technique, the globe is held at 12 o'clock. Similarly, for the inferior rectus, the forceps are held at 3 and 9 o'clock position and the eye is moved superiorly. And for the one hand technique, the globe is held at 6 o'clock position. So what you need to understand is do not retropulse when you are doing this tech, or when you are doing force duction for the recti. For superior oblique in the right eye, hold the forceps at 4 and 10 o'clock position and then elevate the eye in adduction and extort, which is called as traction test. For inferior oblique in the right eye, hold the forceps at 2 and 8 o'clock position, depress the eye in adduction and extort as shown. So here you should remember always retropulse to stretch the obliques unlike what you do for recti. For superior so this is one example of how important the force duction test is. So if you see on table, there's a scarring and you can try to do the FDT. You see it's extremely tight. In the next video, you can see we've released the conjunctiva, but the tightness still remains. So we do a recession of the medial rectus and now the, it's easily free, indicating it was a muscle tightness alone. And then you put it at a position where intraoperative FDT shows a freely moving muscle. So you know exactly to leave the muscle in that position. is achieved either by a curved locking forceps placed at the limbus to achieve retraction and stabilization of the globe or with traction sutures using silk, mercelline or 6O vicryl which are placed in the episclera. The various conjunctival incisions are limbal which is easy, quick, ideal for adjustable surgery but has the disadvantage of delin formation and retraction of the conjunctival flap. The other alternative is a cul-de-sac or phonix approach taken on a white zone avoiding the blood vessels. This approach is more difficult but allows optimal cosmetic and functional outcome. So when you are doing a phonix incision and you make an opening in the tenons, remember to go to a bare sclera and then go. Because in limbus you have already exposed it so it's easily good to hook. But in this, once you get a bare sclera you have to go ahead hook the muscle, then the, get the pole test, test positive, which means the tip of your hook should come right up to the limbus, indicating that the muscle is properly hooked. So now we'll actually go to the various steps. We know how to start the surgery. Now let's look at the individual surgical procedures, starting with weakening and followed by strengthening. Now weakening are separate for recti and oblique. In recti, we are looking at recession, hangback, Z myotomy, Farden's uh, surgery, in looking at obliques, the superior and the inferior, the superior are the tenotomy, tenectomy, nasal transposition, which is a similar to a recession that we do in inferior oblique, tendon expander and tendon elongation. Now for the inferior oblique, the other surgeries are recession, myotomy, myectomy, and anterior transposition. The strengthening procedures include for the recti and the oblique being separate, recti include the resection, the advancement, and the plication. Whereas oblique, it is tucking and a partial tucking, which I shall discuss. Now, there are these special procedures that I shall be di discussing as a part of the next uh, series of lectures. Now, let's come to the individual weakening procedures for the recti, starting with recession and hang, ba hang back. So recession, as we are av aware, is insertion of the muscle is moved posteriorly towards its origin. And as you can see in the picture, there's a slackening that develops and the force reduces. It can be performed on any of the six extraocular muscles. Now, what is hang back? It suspends the muscle back posterior to the scleral insertion, which is suture to weaken the muscle. As you can see, and the suture is tied at the insertion. So since the needle is passed through the thicker anterior sclera, there's a good exposure and also it's much safer. But the disadvantages, narrowing of the muscle insertion can cause a central sag. And hence, it's better to avoid anything more than six millimeters. Also, it's unpredictable because sometimes it can either creep up or move down. So what are the indications of hang back? A supramaxent recession is needed but unable to pass due to the risk of scleral perforation. Is a recession over a retinal buckle on an area of scleral ectasia as in high myopia. So it's only reserved for such cases. Otherwise, a direct recession is a better option.
for lateral rectus recession, take an inferotemporal fornix incision, pass a muscle hook beneath the recti, do the pole test to ensure that the whole muscle is engaged, pass a second small hook on top of the muscle to free from overlying tenons and conjunctiva. A small snip through the intermuscular membrane exposes the tip. Separate the tenons anterior to the insertion. Isolate the muscle and pass a double arm sixovicral suture in a three fixation technique with interlocking sutures at the end. So this allows the muscle to be completely sutured. Completely well. disinsert the muscle after placing the curved locking forceps on either sides of the stump. Before placing sutures on the sclera, ensure that a rectangle is maintained such that the insertion is parallel to the barbie retractor. Measure the desired amount of recession and suture the muscle to the sclera. At the time of passing the needle through the sclera, ensure that the needle is visible throughout its tract. Close the conjunctiva using a atovicral interrupted sutures with or without tenon suturing. After securing the muscle, Take scleral bites through the muscle insertion. Measure the suture with calipers to determine the distance the muscle needs to be recessed from the insertion and then tie the knot and allow it to slip back. This surgery avoids scleral perforation. However, take care while passing the suture near the insertion because the sclera is very thin. So this is an here one hangback we have done in a patient. As you can see, the patient, uh, the person had already had a recession done and we had to re-recess and it was significantly behind. So if you can note that we have put it at a particular distance, as I said, I avoided more than six millimeters followed by a square knot. And what I tend to do is I tend to mark using the marker pen so that it's easier to know where exactly to go ahead. Now coming to the other aspect of weakening procedure, the Z myotomy, as you can see, it is reduces the action of the muscle by decreasing the rotational force on the globe. 70% of the muscle width is sectioned from above and below. So what you need to do is when you cut, it should be significantly crossing beyond half so that this part gets lengthened. If you cut less than that, it will not help in getting the effect you want. You have to go beyond 50% of the width of the muscle. So when it is indicated, if you want further reduction in action, as a, already a surgery has been done, like a recession has been done, it's extremely thin, the sclera is thin, an implant or explant is there, and you want to still elongate, then you can do this. Uh, there's an encircling tube placed directly behind the insertion, like for retinal surgeries, it's easier to go ahead in an already recessed muscle. But disadvantages, irreversible. Now coming to the last aspect of uh, weakening procedures, that is Fardin. Now we are aware Faden is a German word which means thread or suture or sling. It's a posterior fixation suture or a retropexy or a retroequatorial pyopexy or going beyond the equator. It was described by Coopers. What is the principle? Little or no effect in primary position deviation, but it weakens the muscle progressively as it moves in the direction of action. So used in cases where the rectus muscle, over, uh, muscle overcorrection is present, but not any deviation in the primary position. So what is the mechanism of action? Reduces the arc of contact, active length muscle shortening, and the moment arm is reduced in the lever system is reduced as is shown. So these are the recommended distance. As you can see, significantly behind the insertion, as you can see, different for the different four muscles. So what are the advantages? Decrease the likelihood of over-reduction, especially in case of non-accommodative conversion excess when we wanted to work only for near reduces upshoot and downshoot in those with extreme adduction like in DRS. Post-operative force duction following this procedure is free, so it does not interfere. It also saves the ciliary blood vessel from damage, which is associated with recession and resection if you're only doing the Fardin operation. But it has its problems, like needs a vigorous traction on the globe to facilitate the suture application because you understand it's significantly beyond the insertion, very much behind. So difficult to apply. Chances of globe perforation, therefore, are more. You need to again look at other things like vortex vein, which can get injured. And a weakening effect can be anywhere as less as zero to 10 prism diopters is reported. A risk of undercorrection, primarily more than overcorrection, is noted. So even if it is said too much, not very, very good effects are noted with Fardin. So the indications are for incompetent strabismus, where we want the deviation controlled in a one particular eye, in a one particular gaze, like nerve palsies, thyroid myopathies, Duane syndrome blowout fracture, esotropias, 
and dissociate vertical deviation and nystagmus. So it can be definitely tried, but not a primary um, method of surgery. Fardon operation, posterior fixation suture. The amount of posterior fixation suturing is as shown in the table here. Measure the distance of the lateral rectus from the limbus. Mark the desired position of the suture placement on the sclera. Place a non-absorbable fiber dacron suture through the partial thickness of the sclera and the adjacent one-third portion of the muscle and then tie a knot. Similarly, place the suture on the other side of the muscle. One can also achieve the posterior fixation by placing a single non-absorbable suture in the center of the muscle as can be seen here in this picture. So this is done for a patient in whom we did a simultaneous recession. So in that case, since you're annually re recessing the muscle, it's easy to put the fardon at the center. Fardon op now this is another adjustable fardon procedure, which we had uh, uh, written up for a patient with a fixation link hypotropia in which when the patient tried to fixate at distance, the eye would just go down. So we decided to do a combined recession resection, which is on an adjustable for the inferior rectus, which works in a similar fashion. So here we have taken a limbal incision uh, suture. So try to have this particular way of doing a limbal so that you can put it back in the same position. Making pockets in the fornix, you are hooking the inferior rectus. And as I said, this is in direct visualization. So isolating a muscle is much easier. Always remember to break the additions with the inferior oblique and the lids very important so that there is no lid abnormality post-operatively. So all the connections are completely separated in this patient so that we have only the inferior rectus muscle. After that, what we do here, we resect the muscle along with a recession. So a resection of 7.5 millimeter was done. And in case of resection, as I said, we take, I take a central knot, which allows the muscle to be in a position. There is no central sag. As I said, there are a lot of techniques of doing surgery. People use whip sutures, et cetera. So there's nothing better than the other. What you have learned with your mentor this has taught you is a, is a comf and what you're comfortable is the best technique for you. So as you can see, we have interlocking sutures taken on either side so that the center remains intact. I also prefer to uh, uh, put a clamp and little cautery so that that particular stump remains intact and does not sag down. This part of the muscle is then removed. As mentioned earlier, leave a little bit of stump so that you can suture it. Remember in this, we did a 7.5 millimeters of resection followed by seven millimeters of recession. And remember if you're recessing more than six millimeters for an inferior rectus, always nasally transpose it so that there is no hyper, no abduction effect of superior oblique cannot be counteracted and there's no XT in down gaze. So I have nasally transposed it. So this was an checked on, adduct, on, uh, on adjustable. And finally we put it at seven millimeters from the uh, from its uh, from the limb, from its original insertion. So this is a resection re recession effect, which is also called as adjustable fardon. So now coming to the other weakening procedures for oblique, the superior and the inferior. We will be talking about the superior first, starting with the tenotomy and the tenectomy. So as you are aware, superior oblique basically once it's reflected from the top clear, it becomes a is a tendon. And hence, the superior oblique weakening procedure could be a tenotomy or a tenectomy. It is reserved for bilateral weakening with or without horizontal muscle for A pattern. Unilateral weakening can also be done in Brown syndrome uh, and isolated inferior oblique muscle weakness. But a tenotomy or a tenectomy, where pangas or muscle is removed, is very unpredictable and the patient can land up with an ipsilateral superior oblique palsy. Hence, it is not preferred much. For tenotomy of the superior oblique, take a superotemporal fornix incision, hook the superior rectus muscle, and look for the glistening white band of the superior oblique tendon beneath. Use a small muscle hook to pick up all the fibers of the superior oblique tendon and separate the fascia carefully from the tendon fibers. Place a small hook underneath the isolated tendon and cut the muscle along the insertion. For posterior 4 tenectomy of the superior oblique. After hooking the superior oblique tendon, split the tendon carefully at the anterior 1 and posterior 4 junction. The anterior fibers are spared 
for preserving in torsion. Perform tenectomy as shown here. So here part of the posterior fibers are removed as shown here. Nasal transposition of the superior oblique. Hook and isolate the superior oblique tendon. Pass a non-absorbable suture like fiber dacron over the superior oblique tendon close to its insertion. Disinsert the tendon. Pass it underneath the superior rectus bringing it out nasally. Maintain the correct orientation of the superior oblique and suture it 8 mm posterior from the insertion of the superior rectus muscle as shown. Take care to prevent injury to the superior rectus muscle or the globe by the needle tip during the passage over the sclera underneath the superior rectus muscle. So this is very good if you want to really break an A pattern of more than 20 and it works just like an inferior oblique recession. Since you are putting it nasally, it tends to become very huge in terms of breaking a large A pattern. Now coming to tendon lengthening procedures, these are three of them which I shall be discussing. Superior oblique split tendon elongation. Isolate the superior oblique tendon. Measure the desired amount of lengthening. Place a 6 ovicral suture on half the tendon width at one end. And you can see that one side is on one end and this is on the other end because we need to cut it in a Z in such a way that you can join the two and increase the length. Split the tendon horizontally, cut it in a Z fashion. Tie these cut ends together to elongate the tendon. Other thing what you can do is suppose you want more effect rather than joining them together, we can also leave some amount of a suture in between, wherein it will act like a chicken suture over and above your Z plastic. Three millimeters of tendon split will result in six millimeters of separation. For silicon expander, isolate the superior oblique tendon by two hooks. Secure it by placing two fiber dacron double arm sutures on either sides of the hook. Transact the tendon between the two pre-placed sutures. Position the silicone band between the cut ends of the tendon and secure with the double arm sutures on either sides of the silicone band to get an elongation. Sometimes this sharp edge of the, of the silicone expander can come out. So you have to, after suturing, ensure that you nicely bury it within your tenons. Suture the tenons on it and then the conjunctiva so it doesn't extrude. Since there is a possibility of extrusion of the spacer, chicken suture can be another option. In this case of Brown's, note the tight superior oblique tendon. After taking a superotemporal incision, the superior rectus is hooked and isolated. The superior oblique tendon is then hooked nasally as shown and isolated with two small hooks. So up till now what you saw was basically a temporal isolation. In this we do a nasal isolation to put in the chicken suture. Double arm 6 ovicral sutures are then passed through the tendon in three point fixation as shown. The free ends are then passed proximally and tied together in a bow tie fashion. Keeping about 4 mm of loop on either side to allow 8 mm of separation. The tendon is then cut in between. Exaggerated traction test for superior oblique is now repeated and seems okay. And the bow tie suture is released and secured in a knot. Note the 8 mm separation between the two ends. Conjunctiva is sutured with 8 ovicral interrupted sutures. So what you need to understand here is this is basically done for a Brown syndrome. Uh, you have to measure the length and sometimes we feel that it, we want to have much more than what is required. So it becomes difficult since you've already cut in the middle. So there's a good option which Dr. Sharma has also mentioned. Rather than suturing in between, you can entire insertion is released. You take a suture around it 
and then pass this into the insertion of the superior oblique so that if you want to get more effect you just have to release it at the uh, the fan shape insertion so this is like a hang back superior oblique recession that you can do so you can get the exact amount not worry in between if you have to re-suture it and release it further so now coming to the inferior oblique we will first discuss the recession so let us understand this is the inferior oblique which is right below the sagittal rectus in case of inferior oblique recession we are just moving downwards along its path but when we start moving anteriorly that is closer to the inferior rectus it forms the part of the anterior uh, transposition that we are also going to be discussing so to begin with inferior oblique or recession could be by the finks method where it only produces slackening and here the inferior oblique is inserted 4.4 mm lateral and 4 mm posterior to the lateral end whereas the parks method where there is slackening and mild anterior transposition which means we are going closer to the inferior rectus insertion here it is 2 mm lateral and 3 mm posterior to the lateral end that is anteriorized by 1 to 2.5 so as you can see this is a which is the finks method and this is parks method so here we are going a little more anteriorly so this is how we have to do a graded recession depending on the overaction as plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 and plus 4 So plus one is four millimeters posterior and two millimeters lateral. Plus two is three millimeters posterior to the IR incision insertion. Plus three is one to two millimeters posterior and plus four is at the IR insertion. The other option are myotomy and myectomy. Now myotomy is when the muscle severed from its insertion and not reattached. Now usually one millimeter at the insertion there is some amount of tenderness effect and you can cut it there without any bleeding. but in myectomy a part of the muscle is excised in addition to the disinsertion the muscle is then you have to ensure if you are doing a myectomy the a muscle goes back and retracts in the tendon in the tenon's capsule and the conjunctiva is closed because in those cases you can get back and uh, hook the muscle again along its path so what are the advantages faster to perform no need for scleral suturing so less risk of perforation but yes it is irreversible though you can sometimes even hook it ensuring you have put the muscle back into its uh, tenon's capsule but risk of injuring the inferotemporal vortex vein stays and inadvertent sectioning of the inferior muscle can also happen which is a rare complication so be sure what you are hooking and finally anterior transposition now what is basically anterior transposition as i mentioned when we go closer to the inferior rectus and one when we go anterior to it as well when we go anteriorly especially in cases of inferior oblique overaction with dvd here it acts as a anti elevator not a depressor so that when the eye tends to lift up due to dissociative vertical deviation it's this io overaction which is anteriorly transposed prevents the eye from going up acts as an anti elevator so what are the mechanisms new infer insertion is anterior sometimes if you have resected the muscle by more than 3 mm it will prevent the eye from going up and the z z uh, sorry the ga deformity as you can see the neuromuscular bundle neurovascular bundle prevents the eye from going up and therefore it acts as a anti elevator so let's look at the various surgeries of inferior oblique inferior oblique myectomy take a inferotemporal phonic incision about 9 mm from the inferotemporal limbus hook both lateral and inferior recti as shown identify the triangle made by the vortex vein sclera and the muscle just lateral to the vortex vein place a small hook place it flat against the sclera gently slide the hook beneath the inferior oblique muscle until the inferior oblique is engaged allow the inferior oblique muscle to fall in your small hook and bring it up do not pierce the tenon's capsule there thereafter separate the tenon's fascia so as to expose its small hook Isolate the whole muscle by placing the muscle hooks on either sides. Look for any unhooked muscle fibers. One should be able to see the sclera on either sides of the hooked inferior oblique muscle. For myectomy, place two hemostats 5 to 8 mm apart to clamp the inferior oblique muscle belly and excise the portion lying between the hemostats. Cauterize each end for hemostasis and release the clamp. allow the muscle to retract back into the tenon sheath and then close the conjunctiva with interrupted sutures so sometimes when you are doing a myectomy you can actually do in terms of 6 mm 8 mm and 10 mm measurement to get the effect but remember to put it back into the tenon sheath anterior transposition of the inferior oblique 
Isolate the inferior oblique muscle, clamp the end that is closer to its insertion. Then secure the inferior oblique muscle with six cervical sutures as shown here. The insertion should form a bunch. Cut it and reinsert the muscle to the sclera adjacent to the inferior rectus at graded positions as shown here. So as you can see, I put it anteriorly because this is a case of DVD. And since it was bunched, there's no problem. Otherwise, you have to ensure this posterior aspect is way below, about two millimeters below, so that there's no Y pattern when the patient looks up. The eye does not go outside. I mean, go into an exotropia and up gaze. The placement of the inferior oblique with regards to the inferior rectus muscle will depend upon its overaction and will follow the table as is shown. Yeah, so now we'll be just uh, summarizing. So in recession, which is the most common, it changes the arc of contact with the globe. Marginal myotomy weakens the muscle by reducing the number of contractile fibers. Effective post-recession or when recession is contraindicated due to some other ocular issue. Myectomy is reserved for the inferior oblique muscle. Free tenotomy is disinsertion, which was done for patients with CFUMs. Pardon operation is a posterior fixation suture, does not affect in primary position and weakens the muscle action in patients who are orthotropic. Conjunctival or tenons recession may help in augmenting the weakening effect of rectus. It's for large deviations, especially after previous surgeries. Spacer or suture are for controlled weakening procedure for superior oblique, muscle lengthening by inserting a silicon expander or a non-absorbable suture. Now coming to the strengthening procedures for recti and oblique separately. So let's look at the recti. Let's talk about first about resection. As we are aware, it's the effective pull of the muscle is enhanced by shortening it. It tightens the muscle without improving the muscle strength. It produces incompetence, so you need to do it in a controlled fashion. Tightened muscle restricts rotation away from the resected muscle and suitable only for the recti. The steps, yes, expose the muscle. Two absorbable sutures are inserted at a predetermined point posterior to its insertion. The muscle is excited, stump is reattached to its original insertion. So what are the minimum for the horizontal recti? It's about four millimeters maximum anywhere between maximum about 10 and for LR up to 12. On the other hand, minimum for the vertical is about two and maximum about five to six. Yes, you can go higher when you have an incompetent strabismus, not in case of competent, where the measurement should be as mentioned. So resection, as I said, most common strengthening procedure of recti, make sure all attachments are released so that the muscle can completely come up fully. Maximum of MR is six millimeters and of LR nine millimeters to prevent a limitation of abduction. For medial rectus resection, take an inferonasal phonix incision. Hook the medial rectus muscle and separate it from the overlying tenons and conjunctiva with the help of a small hook. Expose the tip of the hook by snipping the intermuscular membrane. Isolate the muscle by separating the intermuscular membrane on either sides of the muscle. Place another hook as shown. Measure the desired amount of resection needed from the insertion using a caliper. Place a double arm six cervical suture and secure the muscle using a three fixation technique. As mentioned, the central knot will allow it to remain central and not allow it to sag. And the side ones are locking sutures taken on both the ends. Clamp the muscle using an artery forceps, just anterior to the sutures placed. Subsequently, cauterize the area anterior to the clamp. Thereafter, release the clamp and re-cauterize the area clamped and cut the muscle here. Severe the remaining stump from the insertion and place the curved fixation forceps on either sides of the insertion. Place double arm sutures perpendicular to the scleral incision through half thickness sclera and tie the knot. Take care that the muscle is centered on the insertion line.
So the reason here is being a phonics incision, sometimes the eye completely rotates and we are not really sure. Hence the curve fixation is a good way, not only for this, but for recession to know exactly in which direction to put it. You can see the muscle completely coming up and does not tend to fall. And secondly, I also use curve fixation on either sides to hold when I do a conjunctival uh, suturing so that there is no gap between the sutures when you're suturing with an ato vicryl. Now coming to the other aspect of strengthening procedure of the rectite, that is the advancement. It's used to enhance the action of a recessed muscle. Disinserted muscle is advanced nearer to the limbus or closer to the original insertion. So best in done for reoperations where there's a consecutive squint developing. Disadvantage, yes, if placed ahead of original insertion becomes matted in fibrous tissue and is thus ineffective. And sometimes muscle belly with the under surface becomes adherent to the original insertion and therefore that can also cause a different outcome that you would not expect. It's less physiological than resection and cosmetic results may be poorer. Now coming to the final part of uh, strengthening procedure for recti, that is application. Now one st uh, study done by uh, Chaudhary et al showed their technique of uh, doing it, the surgery, which is a potentially reversible sparing the anterior ciliary vessels and less traumatic. But here you use locking sutures are placed on the side so that the central ciliary vessels are spared and the muscle is drawn in, uh, forward on itself or over it. And I'll just show you with the surgery. So each muscle edge is then sutured to the sclera with the corresponding muscle pole. So this is basically considered as a vessel sparing surgery, but it may not be absolutely true because over long and all reversible because sometimes you're not able to reverse this entirely. But yes, in the initial stages may be true. So yes, technique one where if you have to do a resection, you first mark the point where you need to do and the amount to be resected. You pass the sutures as shown here. Then from there, you get your double arm anteriorly and pass it at the point anterior to the insertion or just at the anterior insertion. Then using your uh, hook, you push the muscle back and get the muscle over it so that the muscle folds on itself. As you can see here, it is folded and the muscle is right up and then you suture it in back. This is then followed by removing your muscle hook. So this is one technique. The other technique on the other hand, you bunch the muscle over it. So you roll the muscle, you lift it up and so, so you find it forms like a ball over it, which eventually flattens. So as you can see here, we've done plication, the muscle has come and then we are holding it to try, but ensure that the muscle is completely come up because at the edges, it may sag down. So you have to ensure both the ends that it's really closer. Otherwise there'll be some amount of recession effect to it. Then as you see here, I'm checking on either side whether the muscle has completely come up. And yes, then finally you tie it up. And this kind of the muscle, which is rolled on itself, forms like a ball, you can see. But over time, after about four to six weeks, it's completely flattened. So it should not be a pro problem. And as I said, I use these curve fixation on either sides to lift the ends. And then to do a conjunctival suturing with atovicryl. By this, I'm ensuring that there is no gape and the conjunctiva is well opposed. And that's important because finally, strabismus is some amount of cosmesis is also needed. We don't want the muscle to, uh, the conjunctiva to be not correctly sutured. The other way of also closure is using glue, which can give you the same effect. So here you can see that even with one or two sutures, you are able to perfectly approximate your conjunctiva. Now coming to the oblique strengthening procedures, we are starting with tucking and partial tucking. So first tucking is reserved to enhance the action of the superior oblique muscle. It's performed only in congenital fourth nerve palsy where the tendon is lax and that is confirmed on a superior oblique traction test. So let's look at the technique of tucking. Superior oblique tucking. Begin the surgery with a traction test, either with a two-hand technique or a one-hand technique, thus confirming the superior oblique tendon laxity. Expose the superior oblique muscle with a Steven small hook. Pass a double arm fiber dacron suture from the insertion equal to the intended amount of muscle shortening. Tie the suture so as to form a loop of the redundant muscle tendon. Intraoperative traction test is performed at that time. After confirming the measurements, 
The muscle is secured further by passing Dacron sutures on either sides of the loop. Traction test is repeated again so as to confirm the required tightening. It's always a good practice to compare the traction test with the normal eye or to check the fundus on table to rule so out too much of intorsion. a perfect traction test, it's important that you're, uh, you should not getting over tuck so that the line joining the medial and the lateral canthus the eye should go beyond it and always do get a smiled brown that you can allow because subsequently that can even loosen. So this is how you would confirm a tucking. Now, the other so partial tucking that I was talking was Harada Ito procedure, which we only tighten the anterior fibers of the superior oblique but that will induce torsion without affecting depression and abduction. This is done in partially recovered superior oblique policy or an acquired case where there's only large degree of extortion, especially in the down gaze. So what you do is, this is your superior oblique tendon. You split it at the anteriorly and you get it closer to your lateral rectus about eight millimeters. Here you've disinserted here, disinserted the anterior fibers, but in this case, you have not disinserted. You've just pulled it in such a way that you get it anteriorly, but ensure that this length is long enough. Otherwise you'll induce a Brown syndrome. So let's look at the Harada Ito surgery. So as mentioned, hook the superior rectus, then look at the superior oblique, move it na uh, nasally so that you can actually see the fibers. Important to detect the entire fan shape. When seen under higher magnification, you will notice that it is complete, the fan is completely there. And once you've detected that, the anterior fibers have to be hooked. And you see, I'm separating them with a small hook along its entire length. About 15 millimeters is important because as I said, we don't want to induce a brown. I'm confirming it's long enough. In this case, I've disinserted after passing sutures through the anterior part, that is the intorsion fibers. After you've disinserted that, you get it and you measure it that it's more than 15 millimeters, which I've confirmed. I get it closer to the lateral rectus and about eight millimeters behind, we add it and then check. So also on table, you can check for the torsion effect. Sometimes it's possible. You can mark on the, like I've marked this patient also here to see if the torsion changes, to see if that helps. This was done in a patient who had a, a quiet a post-traumatic uh, superior oblique extortion, which he had in those in this particular case, it was done for this reason. So just to summarize resection, most common strengthens by muscle length shortening, avoids excessive resection to prevent eye movements restriction in opposite direction. Advancement, not a primary position, but can be done on resected or over recessed muscles. Tucking, not preferred for recti, but performed on superior oblique muscle to improve depression and adduction in congenital superior oblique palsy. So the important surgical principles is you aim to correct the alignment to within 10 prism darters of orthotropia. Deviation should be primarily corrected in primary position and down gaze because every gaze may not be possible, especially in incompetent strabismus. Tables, whatever I'll be showing now, or whatever you've seen in books are only guidelines for, uh, guidelines for surgery. And eventually every surgeon should develop his own measurement. Surgical correction of competent squint usually consists of symmetric recession or resection of the bilateral recti. And for large squints, you can use three or four muscles, which have to be operated symmetrically and simultaneously. Remember, a recess recess procedure in one eye is preferred when the patient has poor vision, which have similar procedure in the other eye, and for the acquired non-competent squint. The disadvantage of large recession is that it can create a limitation in the field of action of the muscle related to the arc of contact. The disadvantage of resection is, is the discomfort and there's a limit to the amount of resection done because it can uh, prevent a globe, cause a lot of globe retraction and prevent the globe from movement. Like for example, MR resection should not exceed seven millimeters and LR recession not more than 10 millimeters. Just to end by showing these guidelines are what I follow for esotropia, as you can say, bilateral, uh, and I prefer bilateral surgeries for esotropia, and these are the measurements. And I prefer to take measurements of uh, patients of MR from the limbus rather than from it, and up to should not exceed more than 11 millimeters from the limbus anytime. Otherwise, subsequently, the patient will land up with a consecutive exotropia. Now, these are the guidelines for exotropia. In patients more than 55, I would prefer to do three muscle surgery, up to 50, bilat uh, unilateral is okay, or bilateral only, not a third muscle can be tried. In case of con uh, conversion insufficiency, a bilateral MR resection is preferred if the deviation is more than 10 to 15 prism diopters. 
And these are the guidelines for hypertropia, hypertropia. This is from Rosenbaum. So you will find these guidelines from different books, from different textbooks, from your mentors, etc. But remember, you need to use this as just a guideline. Start doing it and eventually realize what would be. Also, remember, when you pass the sutures, you have to be closer to the insertion, not so close enough that the muscle can slip. But enough, because if you go a two way behind, you're causing some amount of resection and then your outcome will differ. So always to have cons consistent measurements of where you pass, how much to do, and try to develop your own guidelines. Thank you very much. I hope this gave you a basic idea about how squint surgery should be done, the basic methods, and any complicated cases and complications I shall be discussing in the next class. Thank you so much, Dr. Jyoti, for covering uh, a very extensive talk uh, topic in a very um, wonderful way, especially with those very clear videos. I think that made each procedure quite clear to our uh, audience, especially the postgraduates. Sir, do you, would you like to add anything? No, I think it was a wonderful exposition of the various types of uh, surgeries that are possible. And uh, as you rightly said, the videos are very, very uh, explicit and they were uh, marked and Many a times, I mean, there were uh, schematic diagrams also to make it more clear to the audience. So the basic underlying thing is that in strabismus surgery, it is uh, controlled procedures that we are now moving towards to. I mean, more and more, we are moving towards more controlled procedures, which are uh, possible to titrate or even undo. So as I generally say, the rule is that you should use a razor with the, the eraser. Never use a razor without an eraser. So in surgery, a good surgeon will always have a procedure which he can undo or uh, I think improve upon it if necessary. The other point is that uh, we should always be having safe limits. So when Dr. Jyoti was telling about the nomograms, uh, it's important that these nomograms are for an average patient. But whenever there's a, a child like an infant who has a smaller eyeball, then we would have to uh, reduce the uh, dosage because there would be the, the functional equator changes in a, either an eye of an infant or if it's a hypermetropic eye for that matter, uh, the uh, amounts or dosage will have to be reduced for a, uh, such a situation. Similarly, for a myope, you may have an undercorrection with the same amounts. So it is the millimeter per prism diopter rule will not be working uh, all the time. It's not only for the different grades of deviation, but also depending on the axial length. So people have also devised uh, formulas on the basis of axial length, like Gilly's formula is there. The other thing is she nicely showed that you have to be working in the subtenant space and because and maintaining the sheath intact. Uh, the sutures also have to be important that when we are passing in the muscle, it should be full thickness bites, nicely indicating the muscle all through the width. And in the sclera, it should be partial thickness to prevent perforation. And this is much more important when you're dealing with uh, myopes. Uh, for resection, I usually stress a little more that we should be not just having two bites like what we have for recession, but we should have two extra bites for resection because when we are making the muscle tighter, the risk of it slipping is more or even reducing the effect of resection is there. So always take two extra bites for resection. Uh, either you have two uh, separate needles uh, that means four needles all together in a resection, or you can have two needles, but having extra bites in the sclera and back into the muscle. So the same is true for plication that uh, I, I usually like to refer it as the reinforced plication in which we take the muscle sclera and then a bite in the muscle again. Now this we have found reduces the chances of the under uh, effect or the loss of effect of a plication. Uh, so these are certain comments and, and she nicely said that many a time we have to do uh, the surgery and our role is uh, doing a, not just a symmetrical surgery, but I would emphasize it should be symmetrizing surgery. So if there is an pre-operative asymmetry, you will choose to do an asymmetric procedure. But if there is a pre-existent symmetry, you need to maintain the symmetry by doing a symmetrizing surgery. So the uh, word important is it's not symmetrical surgery always, but a symmetrizing surgery. So if it's an incompetent strabismus for that matter, you will have to do an asymmetric procedure to restore the symmetry which was there. So I think once again, it's hats off to Dr. Jyoti for nicely presenting a full gamut of surgeries that are uh, there. And this is the first part. 
and there will be more to come if there are any questions on this part dipti i think we can have them or we will have the questions in the second part so we have a couple of questions on the social portal so i'll just uh, there are you've answered most of them ma'am so i'll just take few that uh, probably you can add on to somebody has asked when do we choose a limbal versus a phonics based incision so limbal incision it could be tried in those in which you are doing say reoperations you are not really sure where the muscle is so it's better to use a limbal incision sometimes and best part is you have to feel the conjunctiva so sometimes on if the conjunctiva is actually fused because it's a resurgery so many a times you realize just beyond the particular muscle at the level of the muscle insertion the muscle is uh, pre- pretty loose so when you always feel the muscle when you are muscle sorry you feel the conjunctiva if you feel at a point the conjunctiva is loose then i would try to go in for a phonics but yes limbal could be reserved for those in which i want to do a larger suppose if i want to do a transposition where i want to pick up the muscle and put it then a longer incision would be better so in that case rather than phonics i could have a limbal incision though i prefer most of the time as phonics but yes sometimes what i do is if i would rather have a phonics incision and extend it a little bit say like for a loop my apexy which i'll show next time i will extend the particular phonics to get me a longer exposure but there is no surgery better than the other it depends on how comfortable you are doing it Yes, limbal and limbal incisions have the disadvantage of bell and formation. So rather than going limbal, you can just go a little para limbal, just a little off about two two to three millimeters, which will work in the same way. But ensure you have a nice flap on either side so that when you are putting in, you can put back and suture it. Sometimes I take these uh, 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 what do you say the uh, non-absorbable silk sutures on that, cut it across and leave it so that when I'm suturing, I can use those back and put it in position so that the shape maintains. That's important. I think. in addition uh, we can just have two more indication one is for beginners to start with a limbal incision is better because then he gets the idea of where the muscle is uh, but after a one or two cases on limbal he can switch over to the phonics incision for uh, most but uh, another indication would be a uh, fdt when you have a tighter fdt you should do a limbal incision because many a times in a long standing squint with a large deviation it may be the shortening of the conjunctiva which will require a limbal recession a conjunctival recession of 4 to 5 mm and that would be possible if you choose a limbal incision yeah. so i think that would be in addition to what dr jyoti said thanks sir there's another question can you please explain the concept of functional equator uh if you have the diagram probably it may be better understood uh, dr jyoti you want to answer that or yeah just one minute Mm-hmm. what we mean by functional equator is that for the medial rectus it is uh, in short it's 2 mm in front of the anatomical equator and for the lateral rectus it's about 2 to 3 mm behind the uh, lateral rectus uh, side and uh, anatomical equator why we are saying is the arc of contact of the medial rectus is going to be shorter on the sclera whereas in the lateral rectus is much wider so whenever you are having a recession the effect is coming from the unfurling of the rectus on the sclera it's like a top uh, if you are having a, a top and you are winding the rope and then you just leave it the effect of torque that you get is on the basis of the unfurling so the arc of contact is very important whenever you are going to do a medial rectus which is beyond the anatomical equator it will create a effect of no uh, adduction at all but just a retraction so that that is will be like a retroequatorial myopexy so you need to remember that when you are doing a medial rectus recession you will have to have a 2 mm in front of the anatomical equator so it will be the limit would be um, just about maybe 5.5 plus 6 11 11.5 mm from the limbus for the medial rectus yeah so that i think now dr jyoti is showing that yeah. diagram yeah yes so that's important that's why i would say like in as as you also mentioned Uh, earlier that when we talk about children they are small babies you should see where the insertion is so in certain children you actually see the insertion to be about 4 mm from the limbus the actual mr so here we should see how much we can go behind so exceeding anything more than 11 mm actually is not a good option because one thing subsequently they land up with a consecutive xc and sometimes the adduction gets significantly limited so you should try to be uh, airing to less than 11 meters from the limbus because beyond a particular point it's then literally hanging on to the uh, this Uh, so the torque is not there you see it's a yeah. force of the muscle is going to have a rotational force which is known as torque and the torque depends upon the uh, uh, force at the point 
plus the uh, the line of action from the center point so if uh, it is beyond that then it will be like a fadden it will be a retro equatorial it will not have a torque or a rotational force at all but it will just have a uh, retractory force so that is not desirable for disturbances right uh, there are a couple of other questions sir but i think uh, it's all uh, on the safe limits and the amount of recession and resections which i think is already answered so i think for want of time we'll um, end the session thank you so much dr jyoti and also dr pradeep for adding those valuable tips um so actually even the next session we have the pleasure of having dr jyoti talking on part 2 of strabismus surgery uh, which will be complex surgeries and complications on october 19 so yeah. we'll meet again on wednesday i think okay. thank you deepthi for uh, anchoring it and moderating it so well and thank you dr jyoti for having that uh, beautiful presentation of the various strabismus surgery procedures it was really a, a, a wonderful opportunity to watch all these together so i think the all the pgs and the fellows and even the other practitioners will enjoy seeing this uh, talk again and again so thank you and we move on to the next day probably and having a much more of the same uh, pleasure okay thank you so much dr sharma and tipti good night